All right. Thanks so much, everybody, again for coming. Um, and I'm just going to pin myself real quick. Okay. Fantastic. Um, welcome. <laughs> Um, I am going to um, do a few intros and say thank yous and uh, talk a little bit about our program. And then we will get into our art talk in a couple minutes here with Vanessa Marsh, who is our fantastic visiting um, photographer today uh, with our Clark Art Talk program. Um, so my name is Michelle Raymond. I am the director of Archer Gallery here at Clark College. And um, thank you again for coming. Um, and I'm so excited to talk about all of our exciting um, different events kind of coming up uh, with Archer Gallery and um, the Clark Art Talks, obviously Vanessa today. Um, we currently have an exhibition up. It's a virtual exhibition by Lara Hunji Kim. And that is called Living Lab. That'll be up through February 8th. You can check that out um, on the website at any time using your phone, uh, computer, whatever device you're using. Um, and it's a super fun kind of energetic exhibition that is just a really kind of, I think, uh, breath of fresh air to experience. And it very much is an experience um, and just a, a lot of fun dancing and singing and you can sing along and it's, it's great. Um, so that'll be up through the beginning of February. Um, and then our next exhibition will start, I think it's February 19th uh, with Yulia Pinkusevich, who um, is a, also a Bay Area um, artist and a professor at Mills College. And she um, is a drawer and painter. She also does installation and sculpture. And so that's gonna be a really fantastic kind of um, exhibition. It also be entirely virtual at archergallery.space. So that'll be really fun. And then beyond that, we have um, two more after Vanessa's talks, uh, Clark Art talks to talk about. Um, February 12th, we have Robert Minervini, which I think Vanessa knows. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, yeah. And he's also from Oakland and a fantastic painter and muralist. Um, so come back for that February 12th. I think that's also at noon. Um, and then we have Jeffrey um, Augustine Sanko, who is a sculptor and um, performance artist and installation artist as well. And that is in March. Um, so lots coming up just in our winter term alone. Uh, we'll have more exhibitions and programming all virtual through um, the middle of June. Um, so um, everybody's welcome back at any time and um, we'd love to see you all. I wanna say thank you to um, the art department for being here and supporting me. Um, obviously Lisa, Lisa shows up to like every one of these and it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, thank you to Grant Hoddles, Anthony Stokes, Katharina Holsinger. Um, you all have been just um, so fabulous to work with. Um, thank you, of course, to the, um, to the ASCC and Associated Students of Clark College, Darcy Fighter in particular, and Sarah Guler, um, and every, all the students that are uh, working together with that program to help us and to support us. Um, it's just a really great um, thing that you're doing. So thank you. All right, so um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Vanessa Marsh, and um, I just want to say a few fantastic things about her. Um, she's obviously a celebrated photographer, and um, I've known Vanessa for maybe six or seven years um, from my stint in the Bay. Um, she worked at City College and still does um, when I was teaching there in maybe 2014 or 2015, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, her work is super outstanding. I just love it. Um, I've always loved it. Her pho photographs are gorgeous, imagined, surreal, and sublime landscapes and environments that invoke both a sense of the familiar and foreign, um, something tangible and also spiritual. Um, they always feel like kind of these candies or gems. Um, the colors are just so um, incredible. All the uh, color and texture and light really draw us in and create a stillness, I think, um, that I've really been drawn to, especially during pandemic times um, where everything just, you know, we wanna slow down. And I feel like your work just really kind of allows us to have that space and that time to really slow down. Um, since graduating with her MFA from the California College of the Arts in 2004, um, Vanessa's work has been shown at the Contemporary Jew Jewish Museum in San Francisco, the San Jose Museum of Art, and Dolby Chadwick Gallery in San Francisco. Um, Vanessa has been awarded fellowships at the Headlands Center for the Arts, the McDowell Colony, and Kayla Art Institute, and was the artist in residence at Reiko Photo Center in San Francisco, and the Gentel Foundation in Wyoming. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to host her here today uh, from her home in Oakland, California. Uh, please help me welcome Vanessa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for asking me, Michelle. And thanks for um, thanks to the 
art department and to everyone there for um, for coming and for listening. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit. I'm gonna go through sort of a process of like how I arrived where I am today. So we'll start. Um, I'm gonna start with a few images from a series I did in graduate school, um, and then uh, move on from there. Um, until today and then shows some um, influences and some other people working in similar um, in similar processes and ways. Um, I'm originally from Seattle, um, so I have spent a lot of time in Portland. My mom lived in Salem, Oregon for um, 13 years. So um, I know I know the area and I love it <laughs> and I may someday return, who knows. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with the a PowerPoint that I have made. Um, so uh, I went to Western Washington University in Bellingham. And while I was there, I got really interested actually in Super 8 filmmaking. Um, and so just as a little backstory, um, I uh, produced one film in undergrad. And then it was with that film that I applied to graduate school. So I ended up at California College of the Arts, um, which was then California College of Arts and Crafts. Um, in the film department, um, but my true love was in photography. And so the series that I ended up working on for my MFA project um, involved a combination of those two things. So uh, with this work, I was using little scale models and gluing them to a piece of plexiglass and then taking that model out into a real landscape and filming it with a Super 8 camera and then taking stills from that film um, to produce a photograph. So you can kind of see like the, in the foreground here where the plexiglass starts. And then this is like a real landscape behind it. Um, and the title of the series was False Horizons. Um, the idea being uh, sort of two part, like that I was creating this like false horizon literally. Um, and then also the way that, the way that we can like look back on on old images and old uh, and, and our history in the past in this sort of uh, dreamy, sometimes unrealistic way. Um, so that was the, that was what I was thinking about in creating this. If you're familiar with San Francisco, this is the Cliff House. Uh, so this is Ocean Beach and the Cliff House. And then this kind of in the foreground here is the plexiglass with sand glued to it and then the little figures. Um, so I just have a few of those to show, whoops, I didn't realize that my mouse did that. Okay, sorry, technical difficulties <laughs> as are expected in these situations. Um, and so I, I usually what happens or I found, especially as I've gotten older and progressed as an artist, um, I start to see sort of shortcomings in the body of work that I'm currently working on, or I, I start to see certain things that I'm leaning on um, aesthetically. Um, and so in this work, I wanted to move away from the film still because it just created this such a dreamy, such a blurry sort of beautiful thing. Um, and I wanted to, to investigate making images in a similar way um, that didn't rely on that, didn't rely on that sort of trick, um, aesthetic trick. Um, and so after graduate school, I started working on a series uh, called Always Close But Never Touching. Um, and it's funny to look back on it because I think that the title of the series really spoke to sort of my emotional state at the time. I, lots of people have a hard time in their, like after graduate school um, and in that age range of sort of 20, 23, 24. And I just felt like I was so close to figuring out what I wanted from life and figuring out what I wanted from relationships, but I just couldn't quite, couldn't quite get to it. Um, and so in a way, the title speaks almost more to that emotional state than it did to the actual work. Um, but again, it was um, taking, taking pieces of plexiglass and then I started to play around with uh, the reflection that just the clear plexiglass um, created. Um, and so working more with that and um, I took the figure out of the work um, it was another thing I felt like I was relying on this narrative created by the figure. Um, and so I wanted to take the, the figure out um, of the work. So I say that and then I have one with figures. <laughs> so sort of near the end of the process, I started to bring the figure back into the work, um, which led to the next series. Um, so these are a few just sort of at the very tail end of um, this particular series. Um, and this was this, this was the first series I created really that involved a lot of images. So even the false horizons that I showed that was my MFA project, I think there was a total of maybe 12 images in that group. Um, and 
before that there'd always there'd be like two or three or a group and it was more about assignments in school and with this series after graduate school it became more about um, something that didn't necessarily have a distinct endpoint as much um, if that makes sense um, and so I worked on the series for a number of years and then that led me into um, this next body of work which actually came out of teaching I think teaching is really valuable even if you don't do it all the time like just to kind of dip your toe into it every now and again because sometimes when you're teaching you're not trying so hard to make art you're not trying so hard to make something for yourself and because you have that freedom and that playfulness you come up with things that you wouldn't if you were in your studio like diligently trying to make something good um, and so that was the case with this body of work i was teaching um, actually at city college um, where i'm now more an admin uh, role and I uh, took the materials that I was using in my other body of work into the darkroom to create some photograms. And it started this a whole nother series of work, which led to the next and to the next. Um, and so this was one of those first images that just that day um, in class uh, did this thing and then essentially told my students, don't do what I just did, that's mine. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always work, but. Um, and so I really brought the narrative back in. So I'd moved away from the narrative and then with this body of work, um, I really brought the narrative back in and I started to work um, with the night sky. Um, and so the title of the series is Constellation. I was thinking a lot about uh, the way that the night sky connects us um, to uh, like our, to our past and to our ancestors and how much it connects us to our world. Um, and in the next body of work after this, you'll or a couple more after this, you'll see, um, I start to think a lot about the disconnect that we currently have and how disconnected we are from it. Um, and so here's some examples of these. So with this body of work, I was actually, um, I highly recommend a video you can watch on YouTube about the making of Bambi. And you see this amazing machine that they used to create a sense of movement. So it was like still, um, cells that were on these panes of glass and the panes of glass would move to create this depth and this movement. So I sort of ripped off that and built this box that had these panes of glass that I could remove as I made exposures. So each layer that you're seeing in this landscape was on a separate pane of glass and I would make an exposure and then remove a pane of glass and then make another exposure and then remove the next element. Um, so you would get this depth of field um, in the image. And what I would come out of the darkroom with was actually a negative. So it was the opposite of this. And I have an example of that in a little while um, that you can see. So let's keep going with this. In this series, I was thinking the narrative that I was thinking about was sort of a post-apocalyptic, but like a slow apocalypse, if that makes sense. I think about, we're, we're essentially like living through that now and like since the series and since thinking about that you actually there's sort of been that term coined the slow apocalypse and um so i think about that sort of it becomes like normal because in from our mindset it's happening slowly and um and so it feels like less there's something ominous but it's like not pressing somehow even though it really is um so imagining these sort of little scenes and little stories that are playing out in this um, in this strange landscape. So somebody pointed out to me actually in an artist talk that all of these images have this very similar perspective. Um, and that was that was what got into my head about the next step is like trying to change the perspective and trying trying to play a little bit with um, what I was representing in the images and how. Um, here's another example where the next image I show is the same perspective. <laughs> but this series came out of that, came out of trying to, again, like once again, I'm trying to take the narrative out, um, talk more just about landscape than I am about a narrative, um, and trying to push myself, push what the materials that I'm using, trying to push them into a new direction. I find, especially now, like that's usually where I start. It's, it's, I'm not trying to change all the materials. I'm more just trying to change the outcome. Um, and so using the same stuff that I used in the last series, but, but using it in a way that the photograph or the final image is different. Um, and so I really started um, developing the drawings. So in the 
in the constellation series, you have the foreground, which was actually models and things placed on glass. Um, and then in the background, the mountains and little cell phone towers and, and things were drawings um, on clear mylar. And in this body of work, I moved totally to the drawing. So I stopped using models entirely and just relied on the drawing element of it. Um, this is sort of an interesting one to show you guys because it's, I was given the task by my gallery to make a self portrait. And so I made this image and the, the um, foreground are some trees in Washington state and the middle ground is an image uh, that references the Central Valley. And then there, you have Mount Hood in the very background because I essentially grew up in all three states. And so I decided to make a self portrait about sense of place and how identity is tied to place. Okay, sorry, my mouse isn't cooperating. There we go. Um, this image references a memory uh, growing up in Washington state. Uh, I went to Camp Orkila every summer as a kid. And uh, I have a very strong memory of laying out in this one field. We had sort of a camp night where we slept out in a field near the cabin. And um, I had an one of our counselors explain to us what the starlight was and how far away the starlight was coming from. And I just remember laying there and having that sort of my first real like authentic experience of the sublime, like not knowing what the sublime was, but feeling excited and terrified at the same time by this concept. Um, and I think that experience and just the experience of going to camp and like spending so much time outside as a kid um, really influenced uh, my photography and like what I what I want to make with my art and how much uh, the landscape is important to me. Uh, so this is a more recent one. My uh, grandparents passed away in the past like 10 years or so and this was a tree that was in their backyard. So um, sometimes I pull things into the images that are really personal. Um, and other times I have just more of, a, of an idea or a concept of what I want the image to look like. And using the drawings is really uh, freeing because I can, I can create the space that I wanna create. I don't have to rely on um, getting a, the right shot of something. Um, I can create that space how I want to. Um, and then the title of the work uh, relates to that in a way. So it's everywhere all at once, which references the fact that these images are separate locations that are combined to make a new location. Um, and then it also references the, um, the medium that I'm using. So I'm using a very old way of printmaking photogram techniques. And then the final product is an archival pigment print, which is like a very contemporary way of making work. Um, and then also within the images, there's nostalgic components, but then there's also components like this uh, power line, like contemporary markers as well. So um, trying to combine all those things um, into the images and then convey that through the title. So here's an example of a negative um, straight like out of the dark room. So again, I'm taking those drawings into the dark room and they are layered together. I'm not using the glass boxes anymore. I'm just using like sheets of clear mylar. Um, I make an exposure, remove a drawing, make an exposure, remove a drawing. And so you end up with this depth of field. Um, and then the stars are created with just a piece of black paper with holes poked in it and a long exposure. So there's the final image from that negative. Um, so this, oh, here's, the, these are permanently on display at SFO. So if you're ever going through SFO, um, the United Terminal, they're kind of around a wall. But um, if you're, if you see the Amy Ellingson crazy huge ceramic mural, it's just sort of right around a wall from there. Um, and I think Robert also has some work up at SFO. Yeah, he has a and huge we're all, mural. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we're also both um, in an exhibit at San Jose uh, Museum of Art together we're both in the same show that's up right now. Cool, that's awesome. Um, so from, I actually still work on this body of work. Um, I make like a handful every year. Um, so it's not the same as it was when I first started, but I continue to be inspired to make a new imagery for this. And so I keep going with it. Um, and so a couple of years back, I, I was lucky enough to have a residency at Reiko Photo Center, which is now closed, unfortunately, but um, they had a wonderful artist in residency program where you got uh, six months of just free reign. You could use whatever you wanted for free there. Um, and 
they had a color dark room and I was so excited to sort of translate the process into the color dark room. And it was really interesting for me because I had to essentially turn it all on its head because with the black and white work, I was making a negative and then scanning it and doing everything from there. Um, and with the color dark room, I needed to figure out a way to, because I wanted to make really big prints too. So my goals were to, uh, to make really big prints and to make unique prints um, and to use the color dark room. Um, and so I developed a process uh, that's sort of similar, but the, in a way the opposite of creating a painted negative that I would lay down on, that was to scale the same size as the print that I would lay down on the paper in the color dark room, which is pitch black, and then uh, make multiple exposures again to create a depth of field. And I wanted to focus pretty much just on, on mountains. Um, and most of the time I do focus on mountains like of, uh, on the, from the West Coast, from Washington, Oregon and California. Um, these prints, I wasn't focusing as much on specific places. So I was really combining, like you see all these different, what looks like one mountain range, but it's like elements of a bunch of different mountain ranges combined. Um, and this this print is 40 by 60. So you can imagine that's uh, it's quite a large, a large piece. Um, and then this would be 2024, so a little smaller. And I was thinking a lot with these or looking a lot at Ansel Adams at the time. It was like the first time I'd like let myself do that. I think there was some kind I had something in my head about it being cliche or cheesy or something to look specifically at that artist. And um, around this time, I really, I learned more about him and I look, like started to really appreciate um, his way of working and when what he, his sense of adventure, I mean, just incredible and how much he innovated and how much he changed things. And he, he also, in an interesting way, like created imaginary spaces because of the way that he would process print the prints. Um, it wasn't like anything you would really see in person. I mean, it was very manipulated. And so I thought that was uh, really fascinating. And so I was looking at his work and sort of like playing off of it. Um, you'll see later in my influences, the image that this, that this particular print was um, kind of considering. Um, and then some of the images I started to really combine the digital and the analog. So for this, I created the drawing that you see in the foreground, um, scanned the drawing, printed a digital negative in reverse because in the color dark room, you need the light. The light coming through the clear part is what turns the paper black. Um, and so you have to kind of like shift your whole way of thinking about like how it's going to, how you're going to create it is the opposite of what it will look like essentially. Um, and if you can imagine that like the Milky Way in the background that's from a painting I made. The painting was on a piece of clear mylar and it was the opposite colors you see. So it was transparent ink. Um, this particular painting would have been like magenta and blue and the light would shine through the blue elements and create orange on the color paper or shine through the magenta elements and create green. Um, and so this is an example of another similar, similarly made with the digital drawing and digital negatives and then um, a painted negative. Again, going back to that memory, the Camp Orkylo looking up through the trees um, at the cosmos. Um, so here you can see an example of one of the paintings. So here was the final, the finished product print. And here was the painting that created that um, print. And you can also see in this, the little black specks, which is what created the stars. So in these images, the blocking of the light is what creates the, the idea of light in the image. And I created a color wheel so that I would know what I was doing, essentially a color wheel out of all these different samples of, um, of the different inks and what they what they created in the dark room. And so here's uh, some of those pieces, that first image we saw um, installed at the Contemporary Jewish Museum here in San Francisco. Um, so then unfortunately, Rayco closed and I lost my 
uh, ability to use the color printer, which I'm still sort of working on, um, trying to figure out a way to have my own, but it's rather complicated. And uh, I set out to, like I was saying earlier, I set out to use the same ideas and the same materials that I was using in my studio to create something different, a different in product. And one of my goals too was to find a way of working where I didn't have to rely on another studio. I didn't have to go somewhere. I didn't have to, if, if a place closed, I wasn't going to be kind of um, up Schitt's Creek, so to speak. <laughs> so, oh, you're recording this. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so I came to, uh, I remembered, I remembered Ray Cohen over the years, like seeing photographic paper that had been left out and how if something was sitting on it, it, you would see the shadow of what was sitting on it, that the paper reacted with just the ambient light. And I, so I started to research that and wonder about that and, and figured out that there's a process called lumen printing um, where you expose silver gelatin paper to sunlight, to UV light, and then all you do is process it and fix. So you just fix the image and it, and it creates um, what I, I hope, because there's not very much research, is an archival print. From what I can tell, they're archival. Um, I have ones that I've made, you know, probably four or five years ago now that I've left out on purpose and they seem to retain their quality. Um, and so uh, took the same cut paper, cut black paper that I was using in the falling series, I think I forgot to mention that, the mountains in the falling series were created with cut black paper. Um, and so I continued to use the cut black paper um, in this regard and started playing around with transparency and layering and different ways of exposing. Um, I always do a lot of dodging and burning. Um, so exposing certain parts of the paper um, to create atmosphere and to create depth. Um, and so this is the body of work that I'm currently working on uh, the most. And these are all fairly specific places um, in mostly Pacific Northwest, sort of Idaho. They're all places that I have a connection to, um, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and California. Um, and uh, the breakthrough for me with this series was figuring out this transparency. And it was, again, it was sort of one of those fluke things where it was a mistake. Like as I was making an exposure, I accidentally moved the paper. And then I went ahead and processed that print to see what it would look like. And then it turned into like how I make the work. Um, so I always, I always end up talking about that, like how important it is to, to make mistakes and to, and to um, have a sense of playfulness in some way. It sounds kind of cheesy, but just so you have some openness and you don't get stuck. Cause I certainly, that happens to me all the time where I'll make 10 prints or something and be really, and not realize I'm stuck and then go in the dark room and process all of them. And they all have the same mistake, just like over and over again, or they all kind of look the same. Um, and so to get to get kind of like get myself out of that and this process has been great in that regard there's just like fiddling with shadow and fiddling with yeah the layering and the transparency and the different layers and um, how to do the dodging and burning and um, exposure times and and different how sunlight will affect the paper differently in the summer than in the winter um, it'll affect the pa it affected the paper differently here in California than it did when I was making these in Wyoming. Um, the colors turn out different differently. Um, so I always find that find that kind of stuff really really interesting. Um, this is an example of a piece. So this is just one piece of black paper, and then I just shift it every ten seconds or so as I'm making the exposure, and so you end up with this sort of dynamic, um, strange effect. So. Here's an installation shot um, through the SFO Museum. So this was this was a temporary exhibit, but through the SFO Museum. Um, and this, this was a show this past summer um, at Dolby Chadwick Gallery at my gallery here in San Francisco. So they've been, I've been really lucky. They have really persevered through all of this time and managed to stay open in one form or another and have been launching exhibits this whole time just on schedule. They didn't even put push anything back. So they've been wonderful. And, it was a really interesting experience because I actually felt way more engaged with the exhibit than I have in the past because I had to make appointments with people and go and meet them. Um, I was way more engaged and I felt like I got a lot more out of it actually because of COVID than I would have uh, without. 
So here's another shot of that. And then I have just this short, uh, let's see if I can get it to there. Uh, just a short little demo showing um, how I might make a lumen print. Um, these are, it's a really accessible process. Um, I've gotten more complicated with it because I try to make every print perfect, but especially if you're doing botanicals like you would with a cyanotype or something like that, or like this example, um, you got, you're going to get some marks and stuff from the leaf and everything. So you don't have to worry about being as perfect. And so you really just need fix and you need water. Um, and so, and you don't need a dark room. Um, and so here you can see it getting exposed. And I actually, it happened so fast. I actually slowed that clip down really dramatically to, so you could see it, it change because it changes just so, so quickly in the, in the bright sunlight. Um, and so I wanted to show this just because it's so accessible. So I would encourage people to, to give it a shot if, if they feel up to it. Um, and I do want to note, don't to, do not pour fix down the drain. Um, you have to take that to your waste disposal site. So I like to make sure to get that in. <laughs> Aside from that, it's a very accessible thing. So you can see I'm more complicated, like I said. I, I soak it in distilled water, then fix, then distilled water, then permawash, then distilled water. Um, and so that's just my uptight, uptightness to make it perfect. <laughs> so, um, so you can see it's in the fix now and you can see it gets real bleached out in the fix. Um, you can't really tell what it's gonna look like until it's dry, um, but we'll see here. This is a little, long. oh, there we go. So here it is on the drying rack with some other prints. Um, and then you can see the, the final dried print of the leaf. Um, it's hard to see in this context, but you see all the veins in the leaf because um, the, the sunlight shined through those different elements in different ways. So it's really a beautiful effect. Um, are we done? Okay, there we go. Um, so then I just wanted to show, oh, first some, show some other people also working with Lumen, um, contemporary artists. Uh, Rachel uh, Liu, she does like different, she did a whole series like around COVID-19 things like right at the beginning. Um, and so this is, as you can see, uh, rubbing alcohol splattered onto the silver gelatin paper and then exposed to sunlight and then fixed. Um, and these are really beautiful. Um, Amanda, I'm always afraid I'm gonna say her name wrong. Uh, <laughs> Michard, I think. Um, she does these beautiful, very uh, conceptual pieces. So these are all um, like antique books of like bird birding books. And so she places them on the paper and then exposes it to light. Um, sorry, hold on. I don't know what, I hit something and now it's not wanting me to do anything. Okay, there we go. Um, and her name is blocked because I'm having technical difficulties, but another artist <laughs> this works with lumens. And you can see here, I put this one in here because it gives you an idea of what you, what's pretty easy to do at home. Like even if you're not feeling inspired specifically with your own imagery, it's a process that really lends itself to doing like, like you would with sienna types, um, feathers and leaves and different things that are easily accessible. You can make really beautiful images. Um, here's some Ansel Adams. I use this particular, it's the Teton range. I use the Tetons a lot because um, they're so dramatic. Um, and my dad lived in Idaho growing up. So I spent a lot of time out there. Um, and this is the one that I remember I was talking about one of the pieces. Uh, it's very, it's different, but it, it's, it was this sort of foreground mountain and these mountains receding into the background. Um, and so I looked a lot at this image and creating a more than one of the pieces in that falling series. Um, and some Carlton Watkins. So I've really tried, it's, it's, it's hard in that time range, I've really tried to find people other than white men to reference from this time range of sort of Western expansion. Um, and unfortunately it's pretty hard. There, <laughs> there really wasn't, there was some female photographers and some African-American photographers, but they mostly did portraiture. Um, in this time frame, and so despite research, I haven't been able to come across much else other than white guys that were taking landscape photography back then, which I guess I kind of get it wasn't um, as socially acceptable to be trooping out into the woods by yourself as a woman, but um, I always find that a little unfortunate. I wish I could find someone else <laughs> from that time frame to look at. Um, and the same kind of goes for these uh, beautiful 
um, uh, images, sub, sort of sublime images from the early American, early American um, Frederick Church, and just this amazing sort of um, representations of the sublime and representations of um, this one is actually from Central America, but of the American West, um, and and. And thinking about how they connect to contemporary things like Hubble space imagery. So um, like these Im images we see, you probably, you guys probably already know this, but like the images we see coming back from NASA and from the Hubble, um, they're of invisible gases. And NASA places, places color to the gases. Um, and they choose, like, obviously there's no horizon. So they choose how to compose them. And I think like these two, seeing these next to each other, you really see like how they're referencing, like things we understand already. Um, things that we're used to and sort of putting them, putting these nebulas and these space things into something we can understand. Um, and, and I also think it's really interesting how we consume those images as real when, as if we were in a spaceship out in space, this is what we would see, which is like not at all the case. Um, and I just think that's interesting. Um, with, a, with various series, I think, especially with Falling, I've always been struck I was talking earlier about the disconnect we have now between an experience of the night sky. How many people think those are real? How many people think those are real images? And ask me where I took the picture. Um, and they, they really don't look like what you would ever see. They're really pretty different. Um, and so I think that really speaks to that um, disconnect. Cara Walker and her use of, of narrative and silhouettes and you sort of using these pared down um, silhouettes to really evoke this like strong um, sense of narrative. Um, James Casabre or Casabir, depending on how you want to say his last name. I don't know how. Um, he does these beautiful, surreal, strange uh, landscape models that he then photographs. Um, Lori Nix, same kind of a idea. Uh, looking at Robert Adams and his, his way of, this is from the series Summer Night Walking. Um, and uh, just the square format and the and the way that he uses landscape very much influenced that everywhere all at once series. So there's a few of those. Um, Vija Clemens and her gorgeous drawings of skies and waves and the detail um, and that sort of relationship between the cosmos and space. Um, and I have been loving lately uh, Dawood Bay and this is a series of his that he took he took images um, during the day and then made them look like night of routes along the Underground Railroad. Um, and so I really love this work for how the images stand on their own. You don't have to know that narrative and then how much stronger they are when you know the narrative and you can kind of place yourself. Uh, and I saw, the, saw them recently at SF MoMA and they're so big, the prints are so big that as you stand in front of them, they're as you would see the landscape if you were standing in the landscape. And I just thought uh, it was so well-rounded, the series, like the way that, it touched on all these different things and well, so well. Um, so yeah, so that, that was my last influence and inspiration. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. I just talk so much. I'm sorry. I guess I was supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you did great. Thank you so much, Vanessa. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll open it up for um, a Q and A if anybody has any questions. Anyone, anyone? And feel free to use the chat function too if you feel uncomfortable, um, you know, kind of using audio. I feel connected oh. to, oh, sorry. Is there somebody that um, was raising their hand? No. Oh, I don't think so. Um, um, I was really like, you know, connected to um, what you were talking about as far as, you know, allowing yourself to play, you know, and I think as a, as a teacher, and as a professor, you know, I really tried to instill that into my students a lot. Um, and I really, as a mantra, try to tell myself that as an artist too, because I am such a perfectionist that I think it, it really is something that I have to continually remind myself that it's okay to play. Mm -hmm. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to like, enjoy the process of, and all of the amazing and incredible potential of those mistakes, you know, learning from those mistakes and how, you know, certain series of your work, you know, kind of later on, you were saying like the more recent body um, was very much influenced by this mistake that you made. And I just, I think that's so mm -hmm. fantastic. I love that. 
Yeah, I definitely, I think that's so important. And also to also just within that, like to not expect yourself to be great at something the first time you try it, you know, yeah. like to give, allow yourself some time to kind of grow into it. Yeah. Um, it looks like we have some questions in, in the chat. Um, Delaney asked, what got you into photography? Um, it's, it's interesting. Cause I think my growing up, my mom was a painter. Um, and, and I never felt very good. And now I draw a lot, but at, at, as a kid, I never felt really good. And I think partially because I compared myself to my mom, who is really, really good at drawing and did these or still does these incredible realistic paintings. And she had a camp. She had an old Nikon camera that she had for documenting work. And um, and she gave it to me when I was in middle school. And I think. I think it I think it's that classic thing with photo, how you kind of disappear behind the camera when you go out. I mean, I think that really appealed to me. And I think it really appealed to me to, to have something that was my own, that wasn't wasn't anything that um, that my mom did. And my brother draws really well, too. So I could kind of I could be I could go out and do that without comparing myself to anyone else, if that makes sense. Um, and I and when I was young, I just loved that. I loved taking the camera and going into abandoned buildings and whatever else and sort of losing myself to that process. So um, that's definitely what got me into it to begin with. You're kind of an explorer. Yeah, especially with a camera, like more, <laughs> yeah, I would be less likely to crawl into the abandoned building if I didn't have a camera with it's me. It's funny because I actually, as a child, kind of felt the opposite where I felt so uncomfortable and maybe because I am, you know, a woman, I am female. So it's like, you know, growing up, you know, there are these kind of, especially maybe in the eighties, you know, it's like, um, I grew up across the street from the woods and my parents would be okay with me kind of like leaving and going off into the woods, but um, but I kind of felt uncomfortable going, you know, into a town or a city or anything like that on my own, mm. you know, by myself. And, you know, I had friends later on that were photographers and like, you know, you had a very similar experience where it was like, oh, I have this camera and this allows me to kind of go into these places that I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable otherwise. Um, and for me, I always was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to take this experience home with me and I'm going to be in the safety of my home and I'm just going to sit there, <laughs> and draw, you know, so it's, oh kind of yeah, yeah. Experience, but yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. But it's um, also it's also the dark the dark room always really appealed to me and it still does. I mean, I'm not currently I do use a dark room to process my prints now, but it's more about the big sink than it is about anything else. But um I love being in the dark room. I love that like cocoon womb dark room. <laughs> the dark womb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought um yeah. Cool. Um, it looks like there's some other questions in the chat. Um, Grace asks, what advice do you have for a beginner artists hoping to become a professional? Um, I, I think the thing I always come back to is persistence. Um, any, I mean, going into the art, you're just going into the art world. Like it just is, it's very competitive. Um, and it's, uh, and there's a lot of people who are not going to say nice things to you. And that's just sort of that. I mean, no matter how good you are, that's how it's going to be. Um, and so I think the best thing to be is persistent and just to kind of like, like keep going with it. Don't let yourself get too discouraged. And, um, and then the common thing you hear, which I think is true is to have a practice, but also to be flexible with your practice because sometimes you'll go through six months where you just don't feel like making work and to allow yourself to go through that and come back to it and and not to say oh i'm not an artist anymore because i just didn't do stuff for six months like you can kind of it, it ebbs and flows i think and so um yeah so persistence and having a practice but also being flexible with yourself and um and empathetic you know sympathetic to yourself i think that's become so important especially um in the last year. And I think it's really highlighted how much we haven't been, you know, kind of compassionate with ourselves prior to COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel very similarly in my own practice that, you know, I go through phases where I'm making constantly. And then I go through phases where I just, you know, something comes up and it just breaks my cycle and I'm busy or something, you know, and then in those times I, I feel so just like, uh, oh no, am I an artist? Am I fake? You know, what's going on here? You have all this self-doubt yeah. that kind of overwhelms you. And I think like you're saying, you know, kind of persevering through that self-doubt um, is one of like the main things I think that an artist really, really needs mm -hmm. um, to keep going. 
Um, and then Spencer asks, uh, who's an artist that you look up to? Um, obviously you, sh you showed a few people. Is there any, anybody that you didn't show us that you wanna talk about? I mean, the person that actually popped into my head as soon as you said that was um, one of my professors. So one of my professors from graduate school. Um, and I think it's it's it sort of speaks, it, her name's Jean Finley and she's a film video artist. Um, and it speaks to, um, you know, how, how it's important to maintain those relationships that you have in some way with your professors um, as you move forward in life, because it's good to have somebody who's maybe a little older than you that you can look to as you get older too, to see sort of how they've dealt with uh, different changes in life. And, um, and so I think there's a couple different, a handful of professors still from um, undergrad that I really look up to. Um, and then I have, you know, lots of peers and I think, um, graduate school is really important to me for that in that I went from undergrad, to, I, I maintained more friendships out of graduate school than I did from undergrad, probably because I moved to California too, but um, maintaining friendships with other artists and so you can kind of see what they're going through and commiserate with each other and things. Um, and so I really, I really like actually look up to some of my peers and just seeing like how over the years they've continued to make work and how they've done that. Um, and so we can kind of learn from each other. And I think that was one of the um, greatest things that I got out of in particular grad school for me as well, is like this understanding that we're growing up together and that those connections, you know, if you keep them up, um, you know, you'll kind of rise together and you'll kind of remember each mm -hmm. other when there's an opportunity and, and you look to each other for advice and you get in touch if you want feedback. And so, um, and I think, you know, at Clark, it's, it could be very similar, you know, if you're in a class with somebody and you're really connected, you know, stay connected with them and, you know, see where they go after Clark and like beyond into, you know, other universities and other programs and, you know, um, practices and things like that. And I think, that it's such a, a great thing that school does in general is just kind of mm -hmm, bring us all mm -hmm. together and allow us this community so yeah you don't really there isn't really anything quite like it after <laughs> you know? right right you have a, you have a joint experience you know you have a collective experience together um and it's really yeah it's really valuable for sure um, and then Lisa asks, um, she says, your work is so beautiful, Vanessa, don't take this the wrong way, but do you ever get concerned? It's too pretty, um, especially given that a lot of the influential work you showed had some pretty intense content. Um, I think, I mean, I def that's definitely come up like throughout my practice. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I think it's hard to answer it because <laughs> it actually makes me think of the perseverance topic a little bit because that's just sort of like I, I came to realize at a point that that's just sort of how I work and like what comes naturally to me. Um, my mom, not just being a painter, was also a graphic designer. And so I have a lot of like designer in me and sort of aesthetic considerations in me. And um, I, I got a lot. I had a really hard time with it in graduate school. And I, th I think that it was important to, to stick to who I am naturally than to try to fight against it. Um, I didn't go into it as much in the talk, but I mean, there, there, I do have a lot of like conceptual ideas and thoughts um, behind most of the work. So, um, you know, like in writing an artist statement, there's a lot more to it um, than just it being about the process or about creating something beautiful, but um, that's just my nature. And so I've learned to not, that I don't want to push against that. You know, I, I want to I want to do what comes easier, easier for me than to try to create something that's hyper conceptual or hi really heavy um, when that isn't what is like naturally coming out of me. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then it looks like Joel asks um, that he's sad to hear about Reiko um, and then he took 35 millimeter classes there, continuing the practice, um, but so hard mm -hmm. to find the equipment to process, much less to de develop um, advice on how to get started at home. Yeah. And I'll speak to it in person. I think it's more like, sorry, I meant to say uh, uh, equipment on how to print, how to do prints and stuff too, right? At this point, it's like doing 35, you do color, you can take that somewhere. You do uh, black and white, people are like, out of luck to develop and I really like that process. I guess it's like, um, you know, gear wise or maybe internet resources, anything that can help somebody just starting out or somebody that really is a professional level, how to get some of that done on their own, especially if they don't live in a big city. 
Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I mean, black and white photography is great and that it's it is possible if you have space to set up your own dark room. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's like the easiest thing in the world. Um, and it takes some it takes some dedication to do that, to like set up a dark room in your space, but it's possible. Um, and even with a color color processor, so that's like what I'm investigating currently for myself is like, how do I how do I get and maintain a color processor? And it, it's possible. Um, it is it does take um, some dedication. I I don't know if it's still open and I can't remember the name of it, but for years there was a location in Portland that was sort of a similar situation where you would rent time and you could go in and use the equipment and use the sinks and stuff. Um, to process film and to make, you know, smaller prints, probably nothing bigger than like 11 by 14. Um, and so I can, I can look that up and, and um, email you guys that one, what the place in Portland is. Um, and I know that Seattle has Pacific Northwest Photo Center, I want to say, it's a similar thing. Um, they have dark room, dark room facilities that you can use. Um, and I'm trying to think. Uh, in terms of buying equipment, eBay, I mean, there is just, there is just a glut of equipment um, because so many dark rooms have closed. Um, there's a, there's, you can always find like everything. Um, and of course, like if you don't know B&H Photo um, in New York, they have absolutely everything. They still carry like all the black and white dark room equipment, all the chemicals, all the paper. Um, and they're, they're a great resource. Um, yeah, I but bet you I'm not yeah. the only person that like started taking 35 and then they're just sitting on a bunch of undeveloped rolls, you know, because of, <laughs> you know, like don't know where to get it done or figuring out how. And then uh, I basically I know how to do it, but yeah. I have the gear, but it's like, and all those perspectives, right, from the places that aren't in a big city, you know, I can see there being more and more fall off. So, um, yeah. yeah, thanks for that list. And uh, yeah, any other resources are good to know. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you can you can get all those chemicals and the developing the thing and everything from uh, from B and H. It's just more you. It's actually not that hard. I mean, it's sort of I'm afraid of that stuff too. But then, like once you do it, you're like, oh, okay. And it's about figuring out how to dispose of it too. So the only thing you have to you can't just pour down the drain is the fix, and that's actually because of the silver nitrate that ends up in the fix. So clean fix you could pour down the drain, but you wouldn't want to pour, I wouldn't actually, but you, you could. And, uh, and once you've used it, it has silver, like a heavy metal in it. And so you have to take it to the dump, but it's so easy. You just like show up and give it to them. So it's not like that hard to do that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I processed all the, a ton of lumen prints in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming and um, was able to figure out a place to dispose of the chemicals and to get everything shipped there. And um, yeah, so those are good. I wish I had a better answer. I wish there was like an amazing Rayco in like every town and city, but yeah. Well, um, yeah, yeah thanks, Joel. Maybe one more question from anybody? Anybody has one? Yeah, thanks for all the nice comments. You guys are very nice. It's very nice. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, I think we'll call it there. Um, I just really appreciate your work and um, it's just such like a refreshing, you know, series of, you know, especially I think the more recent ones, um, the color and the light and I'm just, you know, I spend time with them and I just, um, at some point I totally want to purchase one of your pieces because I just, I really oh, like nice. to just sit with them, you know, and they feel so, um, they feel so large and epic, but also really approachable and accessible. And I just think like, oh, um, you know, maybe I connect a lot with that kind of like upbringing, you know, kind of living in the woods and kind of looking up at the stars and really just wanting to like know more about you know the world and um you know kind of everything beyond this world and and just asking a lot of questions so um mm -hmm. I love I love your work and thank you so much for sharing um your practice with us and um your yeah your background and everything so um, I just want to say um, thank you again to everybody for coming. Um, if you um, have any questions for me or Vanessa, feel free to get in touch. Um, you can always um, check out this recording and other art talks um, on archergallery.space. Um, everything will be housed there. I will upload this video um, this afternoon and it'll be available there. Um, and please come back for more art talks um, in February and March and into the spring and um, check out our exhibitions again also at archergallery.space.
So um, thanks everyone for coming and looking forward to seeing yeah. you all next time. And thanks again, Vanessa. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye y'all. Bye.